Hello, welcome to the episode of Motoring Middle East. Today I'm checking out the biggest, baddest pickup I've ever driven. And I mean literally the biggest. This is the Ram 2500 Power Wagon. And if you're wondering what the Power Wagon is or 2500 means, well, let me explain. So the regular 1500 is sort of a light duty, uh, consumer grade pickup. Pretty much good for the normal sort of run in the mill, carrying loads, etc. Not meant for like very, very heavy work. The 2500 is meant for work. It's not, it's a lot stiffer, it's a lot more rigid, it's a lot bigger, and it's a lot higher off the ground. And what is Power Wagon on top of that? Well, the Power Wagon is an off road focused trim level. So, again, what you're getting is disconnecting sway bars, front and rear lockers, bigger off road tires, a two inch lift, a factory winch. That's a lot of goodies for your money. In the Middle East, we're only getting one car in one spec. In the US, you can get a regular basic 2500 with the power back in package, but here we're just getting it as the one big trim all on its own with all the content, all the goodies. And prices for that, not cheap. You're looking at 289,000 dirhams for this car as it sits with a five year warranty. Uh, what's under the hood, you're thinking? Well, in the US, you have a lot of engines that go 2500, but Power Wagon uniquely has just one engine for itself. It has the 6.4 liter Hemi engine. So the engine's 410 horsepower and 429 foot pounds of torque, matched as always to the incredible, excellent, flawless ZF 8 speed automatic. So you're thinking, what is this car for? Is it a Raptor fighter? Is it a Wrangler? Is it a vehicle for towing horse boxes or carrying like fertilizer? Well, the answer is kind of all three. But what it definitely isn't, if I'm honest, is a Raptor fighter. It's something very, very different. It's something very, very cool. Let's explore more, shall we? So what is the power wagon? Well, as Mr. Demuro would say, it's got a ton of quirks and features. Basically from the front, it looks like a 1500, but it's got lots of cunning differences if you know where to look. Starting with down here, we've got a factory winch. Yes, it's actually got a factory winch and it's made by Warren, probably the best winch makers in the business. The controller socket is down here, sorry, down there. Look at that, proper controller socket for your remote. Big, tough, meaty, off-road ready recovery towing hooks down there. So this winch is so strong apparently that you can hang the entire truck off of it. For this year, what they've done is change the original steel cable for this much lighter synthetic rope, much easier to handle. If you look down the sides, you've got a lot of gap here. If you're wondering why that gap exists, it's because this car, this entire truck, is two inches higher than a regular 2500. Oh, don't mind the angle, by the way. I'm just on a hill, on a dune. So down here, the front, actually, let me not finish the suspension right here. If you notice with this car, it's not like your average 1500 with independent front suspension. What it's got is coils and shocks, which means that basically it's locating a solid axle down here. Now, what that really means is that basically this is a giant Wrangler pickup. And ironically, it's got Wrangler tires. No, I'm not kidding. It's got Goodyear Wranglers. These are 33 inch Duratrack tires, 285, 70, pretty knobby, meaty tires. Although, to be honest, when you look at the size of the vehicle, they look a little small, don't they? Yeah, I think this could take 35s out of the box. And this would look best with 37s, like the amazing Prospector package that you get from AEV in the US. Otherwise, it pretty much looks like a stock 2500, which, which, which looks like a stock 1500. The bed is a six foot, four inch monstrosity. The regular Rams are five and a half foot. This is the full, full enchilada. And the reason for that is this car will actually be used for work or should be used for work or towing or carrying. These power wagon graphics down the side are pretty awesome. They actually hark back to a Dodge Limited Edition from many years ago called the Macho, which also had similar graphics downing down the side. Other than that, Ram's been pretty subtle. It's very hard to know that this is a power wagon apart from this big sticker down here, which is power wagon. Now, normally we look at the boot here, but there isn't much of a boot. I will show you one of the things that are standard on the car. Oh, it's got soft open tailgate, so it drops nicely. Inside you've got your, well, that is a bed divider. And this is something that's quite expensive. I'm glad they included it standard, which is a tonneau cover, a Ram tonneau cover. Now it does flutter a bit in the wind because it's not a stiff one. It's a soft cloth one, but there's no reason why it shouldn't last. And just protects your things from thieving people at stoplights. But yeah, it's a very cool truck. And I like that it exists and that I finally get to drive it, to be honest with you, because I've been waiting to see what the power wagon is like off-road for quite some time. This isn't gonna be a very long review because so much of this car is basically similar to the 1500, which we've covered quite a lot. So what I'm going to do is just go over the differences. And that extends to the interior, which really is just a 1500 interior. So let's look at the differences in the power wagon. 
Okay, so for the interior, I'm not going to spend that much time actually because you know what to expect. It's pretty much a regular 1500 on the inside. You've got, of course, all the options. You've got 12 inch display and you've got the same amazing leg room in the back. It is pretty much a limousine back there. Front seats are beautifully shaped and quite ergonomic. So everything falls to hand very easily, including these very handy cubby hole pockets. But the problem is, it isn't the most comfortable seat in the world, to be honest with you. I've done hundreds of kilometers in this car and it's great in the lower back, but the upper back isn't supported enough. These bolsters need to be a little bit more aggressive. So I think the upcoming TRX will have much nicer seats. It's not bad. It's just that I maybe have an unusual body shape. So the cool thing about the screen is you can have this really big navigation screen or you can have two separate cards. So Apple CarPlay on top and your comfort media on the bottom or anything you want. It's incredibly customizable. And this is one of the most handy things because having CarPlay is great, but it takes over your screen. Not a problem with the 12 inch. I used to be really skeptical, but I really like it. The only thing is like all big screens, you kind of have to stare at it and it takes your eyes off the road looking at the screen. Same problem with Tesla's or anybody else, but it's what people want now. What are you gonna do? Usual buttons down here, this is traction control on off, tow haul, a parking sensor, which get a little bit confused, they get dirty and dusty. So make sure you keep them clean. Trailer brake control, um, waterfall buttons on the side. So if you need to adjust your fan speed, temperature and so on, it's all here. I wish that they were a little bit easier to tell apart because is this temperature, is this fan speed? When you're looking at the road, it's hard to know which one you're pressing because they all feel the same, honestly. Um, start stop button down here pretty much the standard display of instruments uh, pretty workable controls I like the steering wheel up to a point I think Rams never had quite a good steering wheel as Ford or Chevy in that regard there's a little bit of um, how do I show this down here there is a little bit of uh, stitching there's a little bit of stitching down here which is a little rough to your hands but it's all well made I can't complain too much so you okay, okay enough you're saying where is the power wagon bits well for that we need to dive down down, 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 down to right here, where we've got the lever, the big meaty lever. Okay, I need to hold up holding it like that. So what this lever basically does is switches you to four low, neutral, two high, and four high. But on normal non-power wagons, it's basically buttons down here. No cheating, don't look there yet. But here it's a proper lever. And why do you ask to have a lever? Well, this is actually mechanically connected to the transfer case. So this is an actual mechanical connection. There's no buttons, there's no electronic little actuators. It's an actual physical lever that moves it between the things. And I don't know why that's better than having electronic, because if I was pressing a button, pulling a lever is the same. I mean, it's very, very satisfying to shift this thing into gear, much like a manual gearbox. Did you know that the Ram was the last car you could get, the last truck you could get with a manual gearbox in the segment? Fun fact. And here is the party piece of the power wagon, the front and rear locking differentials. So basically this one activates the rear, this one activates both of them. You've also got a sway bar disconnect. And all these things basically, oh, this button disables everything and you've got hell descent. All this really means these three buttons is basically give you more options in your off-road toolbox. So normally if you don't have lockers on rocks, you can slip and slip means you're losing traction. If you don't lose traction, you're not going anywhere. What you do is activate your lockers and each wheel turns at exactly the same speed. So before, power flows like water. It flows to the tire with the least resistance. So basically, if one wheel is spinning, all the power will go there, and the stuck wheel will just stay stuck. When you activate your lockers, it, activate, it kind of ties the shoelaces together, so both of them need to turn at the same speeds. And if you have front and rear lockers, that means all four tires are moving at the same speeds. I'm sorry for these very crude uh, descriptions, but you get the idea. What the sway bar does is basically unhooks the sway bar that ties the body to the front axle. That's about as simple as I can make it. And what that means on road is that if you have a sway bar, it makes the cornering nice and tight. The car feels pretty good. But off road, it limits the articulation of the axle up and down. So the sway bar disconnects and then the whole axle drops and it can go any way you like. And with the press of a button, you can just hook it back up again. It's a very, very cool system. And if you know how to use it on rock, there's nothing like it. These are really incredibly powerful tools. And this remains, I think, one of the very few vehicles in the segment to offer both front and rear lockers. If I'm not mistaken, the only vehicle in the segment to have front and rear lockers. All right, enough waffling. Let's see what the power wagon is like to drive. I mean, tough stuff. A lot of people misunderstand what the power wagon is. It's not a car built to compete with the Raptor. Ram's building a car for that. It's called the TRX and it's pretty awesome. 6.2 liters, supercharged V8. There's literally nothing wrong you can do with that. But what this car does is something very different. It's built to be the ultimate go anywhere vehicle, much like a Land Cruiser. Now, a Land Cruiser is again, not fast, not particularly cheap, but it's 
capable, confident. You can take it to any terrain in anywhere in the world and you know that it will get you there. And that's what the power wagon is. It's priced about the same as an Land Cruiser, but it has a lot more capability in terms of what it can tow, in terms of what it can carry, and the comfort levels, and the electronics, and the, frankly, the interior trim is splendid. I mean, this is a class-leading interior. To this date, I don't think Ford or Chevy have really answered the better interior. And on top of that, you get all this off-road capability. So it's built to go into inhospitable places, but it also needs to get there on-road. So what's it like on-road? Well, you've got the classic eight-speed automatic with the rotary dial shifter, good gearbox, 411 horsepower from the V8, 410, whatever, who knows. First thing off the bat, what do you realize with the power wagon? The first thing you realize, that's why I stopped sliding it off because I never secured it. The first thing you realize is that it's a stiff beast. Like this car is built for work. It's the difference between a Prado and a Hilux. Like a Hilux is, is a working car, and this is a working car as well. It still has coil springs at the back. It still has a pretty good ride at high speed. These shocks are pretty good at high speed, but at low speed, the ride is firm and a little grumpy. The tires are noisy. These are Dura tracks. Um, I personally would swap these out straight away for something a little bit more desert focused, but and something bigger. These 33s are tiny. That tells you how big the truck is. But the tires are noisy. You can hear the hum in the background. It only gets worse at speed. Luckily, the truck is super well damped and insulated, so it's a pretty quiet place to be. It's not fatiguing over long journeys, except for the tire noise. And the ride settles down. The steering, pretty slow, but it's designed for off-road work, so you don't need a fast ratio rack. You need steering that's very, very sort of confident, but deliberate. Um, look at that right now. Normally, you go over a bump, and it's a clunk, clunk. Even the Raptor, I mean, it's a little clunk, clunk, but this thing is so soft because you want those long travel um, springs which give you that lovely lovely loping ride and i'm going to go over some little bumps in the road here the sheer weight of this car crushes those bumps away it's accelerating up the hill now it's not fast despite what you might think with the 400 horsepower plus v8 it's not fast it's very heavy this thing fully loaded is well in excess of three tons but what it is, is relentless. I like this V8 and I like these Hemis because they're just beautiful surge of torque. It's a very different feeling from what you get from an EcoBoost Raptor on F-150. It's relentless. This V8 just pulls and pulls and pulls and pulls and pulls. It's not going to break any records. It's not going to break the speed limit faster than anything else. But it feels tough and solid. So you have to know what you're getting, because if you're going into expecting, I want the most expensive RAM, well, it was the most expensive RAM, now TRX has come along, then you're going to be a little bit disappointed. But if you know what you're getting, which is a car that can last 10, 15 years with just basic maintenance and take you anywhere. Now, the problem is, I can't show you what we actually did with the truck, sorry. We took it to a really difficult off-road uh, wadi, which is sort of a dried up riverbed that laid into a mountain pass. It's the kind of place where vehicles collect damage. Let's be honest. It's a place where cars go to get broken because the angles are not nice. They're just unyielding, man. This is a massive pickup. And yet we took it there with absolutely no damage at all. And the car would climb up these sheer faces absolutely effortlessly. I wish I had a camera crew to show you that, but I can only show you desert because that's the easiest thing for me to film. But let you least be assured. Least be assured. Rest be assured. This vehicle is built to do that kind of thing. It's built to go on rocks. So if you put an even more lift line, bigger tires, I think you'd be very happy with the capability of the vehicle. In sand, I have yet to see, we'll find out in a minute, but I'm very, very impressed with what the power wagon can do. The question is, would you live with the slightly stiff ride and the frankly okay fuel economy on a daily basis? Probably not for most people. The Ram or the Ram Rebel, which is a little bit off-road focused as a one-inch lift, the Ram Rebel is better for most people, most of the time, especially in this market where you maybe you might take this truck camping or whatever, or you go to the beach. For them, for that kind of person, for that kind of customer, the 1500 is fine. The Gladiator from Jeep, same company, same family, is also good. But if you need to do work every day, hard work, the kind that makes other cars cry, that's what the power wagon is for. And that's why it only comes with a V8 engine and not the diesel. The diesel is heavy, it upsets the balance and they can't package it. So that's what they say anyway. So the diesel isn't around 
but the V8 is the answer because it's thirsty but it's dependable and I quite like it after a couple of days with this car I get it I mean you have to know what you are as that kind of customer you have to know who you are but if you know what you're getting you'll be very very happy and literally there's nothing else yes you can buy a GMT 2500 yes you can buy a Ford F250 with the tremor package in the US but power wagon is a class of one in terms of what it can do so the only thing left to do is take it off road into the sand and see how it does the sand because that's the most common terrain here so in a minute we'll find out if it does the basics i've made two mistakes today first of all i've let a nasty fly in and he just can't get rid of him and it's gonna buzz around and drive me crazy and probably make me want to kill myself secondly it's 38 degrees outside which means it's probably actually about 40 degrees plus outside it's august it's humid it's hot it's really not the time to go off-road but it's a darn good test of this car and what it can do because you say it's the toughest off-road pickup around well let's find out i put it into four wheel high i have deflated the tires which start at 60 psi down to something like 20. i put it in drive and let's see how it goes but you know what i mean this is very bumpy in other vehicles but the power wagon is just like okay fine no problem it goes I go slowly because it's got that mountain of torque I'm not allowed to use any gears or flip between any funny modes or anything I just pretty much point and shoot very stable it should be it's very long the sideways stability will be the interesting part I don't think it has the shocks to deal with really heavy duty like jumping or, yeah I know the fuel's low I'm cheap sorry <laughs> I'm not sorry I'm just cheap <laughs> the, this is a place you don't want to be in a small little dip but let's see power wagon's doing okay very much it's better than okay all right let's go down the typical massive drop and see how it does this pitch is not bad it's actually pretty cozy okay so slight position reset uh i just went over you and have to be a little careful the one problem with this car is the traction control is always active and you can't do much about it so i'm just going back in a slightly easier way Without fully disabled the traction control, it could be a real risk off-road if it doesn't behave itself. ABS seems fine, but I don't know. It's not a natural dune car. On rocks, of course, it's genius. But yeah, no, it's pretty darn solid car, man. Pretty darn solid. Very hot day. I'm wondering if I let down the tire pressures enough to really compensate for this kind of ferocious heat. It's now 45 degrees out there. It's gone a little bit hotter than when we started. So the sand tends to go very yellow, so you can't actually see anything. Even with sun polarized sunglasses, you can't make out what you're looking at. So you have to be very, very careful. But the car is incredibly heavy and solid, so it does move, it does move. I feel like a little bit more tire pressure with it. I dropped it down to about 18, 18 all around. But part of me thinks that that wouldn't have been enough. If you want to jump over dunes and the like, this isn't the car for you. But if you want to basically just chug through. Think like a Land Cruiser 70. You know those big old nice diesel wagons. It's got the power, eh? It really has got the power. But I'm not going to test its approach and departure ramp over angles. It's just not that kind of car. It's just not that kind of car. So yeah, it's an odd one. It's definitely an odd one. It's a car built for a situation that in this market doesn't exist, which is heavy duty rock, etc. Oh, a bunch of camels having a camel thing. They're just chilling out, really. Okay. So, summation, what do you feel? Well, positives tons of space, tons of capability. Nothing as strong or as heavy duty has ever been built, honestly. This is an incredibly tough car. And it can pull or recover anything. Negatives, well, fuel economy not so great, seat comfort not so great, and it's bloody immense. So in the dunes, you have to be careful. Or somebody who likes really, really big cars. Um, if you're looking at this car, I would think of it as looking at something the Prospector kits or Kali suspension. They do really nice upgrades for this car. But out of the box, it's good to be aware of its limitations. Because if you're not aware of its limitations, you'll get into trouble pretty quick. It, following Jeeps and the like could be really painful and or expensive. But I mean the capability, man, 12,000 pound winch from the factory. You're just good to go. Now, I love this car. I'm just not necessarily sure who it's for. 
and on that bombshell it's time for me to end thanks for watching so it's a bit noisy in here it's a bit hot so i'm just turning the ac running this is intishan this is motoring middle east like comment share subscribe etc